Um, I'm really happy to be here in ICTS in, in, in Bangalore, uh, not because I love ICTS of Bangalore, actually, which I do, but because uh, a heavy weight was lifted off my chest just a few days ago. Well, some of my other LIGO Virgo collaborators. And, and you can guess why. That's because we are all very busy working on getting these papers out. Um, but the problem is that, uh, so now my collaborators outside the LIGO Virgo collaboration know what I was doing the last couple of months. That itself is okay, but next time they find I'm on Monbrat, they will know what's going on. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about what such gravitational wave observations can tell us about the densest form of matter. The implication here is that, uh, because we have been talking about neutron stars, very likely these objects are indeed the densest form of matter. What would happen if you tried to make them denser? Um, the current best understanding is that they would collapse under the weight to form a black hole. And of course, we have seen binary black hole events uh, in LIGO. So, um, we actually didn't talk about the composition of a neutron star so far, so uh, perhaps it is time to bring it out. Um, and my apologies to the experts in the audience, I've tried hard to, um, to, to give a popular talk here. Um, they, Understanding is that we'll have some technical discussions after lunch, so we can um, get to that at that point. So the schematic of such an object is that um, what you're doing is you're squeezing about you know, one to two times the mass of sun in a volume, in, a, in a, basically a sphere, that has a diameter of the order of, uh, okay, maybe I can't say Bangalore anymore because I don't know where it starts or ends nowadays, but, but Pune, where I come from, you know, of the order of 20 kilometers. Um, yes, there is a gradation in density. It's less dense um, near the surface, but uh, don't be uh, foxed by that uh, use of terminology. Even less dense means that if you scoop up a teaspoon from the surface, it would still weigh as much as uh, Mount Everest, something you have seen in our press release, right? But it just gets denser, denser, you know, more and more dense even denser than the nuclei that um, you know, all the material here is made of. So rho zero is basically the typical density of a nucleus you see on Earth. But in a neutron star, as you reach the core, it can get as dense as about twice that nuclear density. But how do we know? Of course, much of this is conjectural, but some of it has been probed in terrestrial experiments. Um, again, to the technical experts, there are relativistic heavy ion colliders where we can study the properties of dense nuclear matter. But if anybody claimed to you that they understand what actually is going on in the core of a neutron star, um, don't believe him. Except, of course, if it is somebody like Professor Srinivasan. He knows what goes inside those objects. Um, still, um, given we are humans that are inquisitive, we want to have some observational, if not experimental, evidence for what actually is happening in there. How can gravitational waves help us probe that? is what I'll try to bring out in the next few slides. Of course, it helps if, um, okay, something I'm not going to talk about, but um, um, is also useful, is what are known as you know, X-ray observations from these objects um, in binary system where um, uh, accreting matter from a companion onto a neutron star can elicit some of its um, um, you know, uh, dense nucleon interaction properties. This, of course, is another uh, you know, artist's impression of what uh, goes on when two neutron stars gradually spiral in and then collide. Um, and um, you have seen some waveforms in the past, and I'll show some of them myself, so that's why I thought I'll show you this animation. Um, so this is one produced by numerical relativity where Einstein's equations have been solved to, um, to track the orbit of two compact objects. So in this particular case, these two compact objects were black holes, but um, most of this orbit will not be changed much if these two were um, instead neutron stars. And uh, what I want your, uh, to you know, do with uh, guiding your eye is that look at what happens to this um, waveform. There is actually a blue tracker here. We just, at this point, is somewhere there. As the two neutron stars, um, okay, so you know, in this case, black holes, but you can imagine these as neutron stars. As they orbit, they emit gravitational waves, which are ripples in the curvature of space-time, and the amplitude of these waves, you notice, is gradually increasing as the objects come closer, but the orbital frequency as well as the gravitational wave frequency increases. 
And ultimately, these two objects will merge when this blue tracer comes to this point. And then for the black holes, the two objects will coalesce to form a single heavier black hole. And that single black hole will be initially per perturbed beyond um, in the axisymmetry. But gradually, those perturbations will be lost in what is known as uh, ring down modes. The reason I'm showing this is because if these were neutron stars instead, then you'll start seeing deviations from this wave evolution around um, you know, 600 hertz, where the initial frequency, of course, you have to go down about 3,000 cycles, the initial frequency will be of the order of 24 hertz. Um, but the final frequency for binary neutron stars, you know, as they are merging, uh, is in excess of a little excess of uh, kilohertz. But it's around 600 hertz, which, which is when they're still you know, uh, of the order of um, several tens of cycles away from merger, that there will be deviation from this prediction because Neutron stars are not black holes, rather they have matter and therefore are prone to tidal excitations or flexing. And that is depicted here. So the black hole waveform um, is shown in black, faint black, whereas other objects, but in this case principally binary neutron stars, will have, um, actually will lose energy somewhat more, given that you have comparable masses, uh, because uh, part of it is being drained by tides. And then they will not coalesce and then ring down exponentially, like black holes do. Rather, their ring down, if you can call it so, will be more muffled or extended. And that is what is shown by this faint blue line here. Okay. So through tidal effects, which are then imprinted on these waveforms, we have a hope for probing what nuclear matter behaves like. Right? So that is the basic idea here. And here are some examples that, okay, fine. Um, we understand that um, nuclear matter can have a different effect on gravitational waves, but how do we then understand what are the possibilities of uh, nuclear interactions and how can we unravel them in these waveforms? So there, you have to understand that there are predictions for nucleonic interactions. In fact, cu currently, we don't have a very complete understanding of how different the interactions of two neutrons is with a proton versus two protons with a neutron. So three nucleon interactions are not completely understood. And therefore, people make you know, empirical fits with observations and also some phenological, well, beyond phenological extensions. So all of these waveform possibilities exist for binary neutron stars, where here, we assume that the equation of state, that is the pressure to density relation of these bunches of nucleons, is um, such that um, the pressure is not very strong. So you take a bunch of nucleons, you know, put them in, or basically neutrons, put them in a neutron star, and if the matter properties are such that they don't exert too much pressure for a given density, then that means that this object will be more compact. Right? We call that a soft equation of state. So the pressure will be less for a given density. And the nuclear density is about you know, 2 times um, 10 to the 20, 14 grams per centimeter cube. So that is about 100 trillion times more dense than water. Um, on the other hand, again, because our knowledge is incom incomplete, there are bunches of nuclear physicists slash astrophysicists who have proposed other equations of state, which are stiffer, meaning for those equations of state, the neutron star will exert more pressure for a given density. And therefore, they will be more extended. They will occupy more volume. So for stiffer equation of state, you notice that the gravitational waveforms, the, the plus and the cross polarizations, you know, both are shown here. They will be different from those from soft equation of state new, neutron stars. So this is, in fact, the observational hand we have on the equation of state of a neutron star. Basically track the gravitational waveforms. Now, the problem is that we have to also have some understanding of the mass of the neutron star that is producing this, these gravitational waves. Um, you can, of course, check how big a neutron star will be given its mass, because remember, I talked about, okay, you can make more compact neutron stars depending on the equation state, or less compact. But the mass also has an influence on its um, radius. But for certain equations of state, the influence is not very large, as can be seen in this mass versus radius diagram. So here, um, given that we have actually observed um, 
in radio waves, neutron stars that are as massive as twice the mass of Sun, some of these strange quark matter neutron star equations of state have been ruled out because they just cannot produce um, such heavy neutron stars. So in some sense, that makes our lives, lives less complicated. But then there are other many um, more equations of state that can still exist uh, based on current observations. And you notice that uh, these you know, blue ones have radii between, uh, roughly speaking, 10 kilometers to about you know, 13 some kilometers. But they can come in various masses, and um, depending on what the mass is, the radius can vary somewhat. Um, double neutron star systems in our galaxy, of which there are of the order of a dozen, have masses between about 1.2 times the mass of Sun and you know, roughly 1.6 times the mass of Sun. And in this particular uh, GW170817 gravitational wave event, we find that those two neutron stars also are from the same mix, roughly speaking. But what I can tell you is that based on the waveform we saw from this event, we are able to already rule out some very stiff equations of state. Okay? That is because their waveforms are not that different um, from the point particle um, waveforms. So for example, this muller zero equation of state, MS2, is ruled out. I'll show another plot, which actually was shown by Ajit also earlier. Um, this just would mean that the neutron stars are still bloated, and we don't see an evidence for that in our, in our, in our signal. Um, how do we actually make that kind of an assessment? The basic idea, and sorry to use some equations, I'll have another couple of slides which will have them, but the, the idea is that, okay, um, if as these two neutron stars orbit around each other, I mean, and they will be tidally extended, right? But that means they'll have deformations, which you know, we term as quadrupolar deformations. And this quadrupolar deformation is measured by this tensor Qij, and it is proportional to the tidal field of the companion, which could be another neutron star, such as in this case, or, uh, or a black hole, right? And Eij is nothing but the double derivative of the Newtonian potential, of course, in the Newtonian approximation with respect to the spatial coordinates in Xi, Xj. So, and lambda tells us, again, how stiff or soft this equational state is. If lambda is large, that means the same tidal field of a companion will create a larger quadrupolar deformation. Okay, if lambda is small, a lesser quadrupolar deformation. What the LIGO papers reported is a value, big lambda, value for big lambda, which is a combination of the small lambda divided by the fifth power of the, um, in this case, the mass of a neutron star. But of course, you can also create something similar using the average mass of a binary neutron star system. Um, this quantity is quoted because it is dimensionless. That's how it turns out if you work out the math. And it depends on what is known as the second love number, which, uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, is known also for other objects like, like the Earth, and tells us you know, how much of an extra potential you add because of deviations from asphericity. And this value uh, for neutron stars, for the various equations of state that I showed in the previous slide, um, can range between 100 to, th um, to, to 100,000. And as you heard um, in, the, in the second talk, um, with LIGO observations, we find that this, the value for lambda has to be less than 2,000 at most. Okay? It could be narrower if we knew the spins of the neutron stars better, but we can't measure the neutron star spins that well. And although this object was very close, remember, we are not operating at advanced LIGO sensitivity, so we, we had some challenges. But nevertheless, you know, shelving off um, a big part of this range, because 2,000 is still much smaller than 100,000, you know, is, is, is an achievement of sorts, although extra astronomers will tell you we already knew that, and they're right. <laughs> but it's good to have a different handle. Um, by the way, once these two objects, these two neutron stars coalesce to form a hypermassive neutron star, then this, will, this object will also radiate gravitational waves, as you saw, you know, those extended waves. And they are interesting in their own right because there's a difference between two isolated neutron stars or somewhat separated neutron stars and one big coalesced neutron star. The reason is here you cannot neglect some, you know, some types of thermal effects or temperature effects. In other words, the equation of state of a merged object can be somewhat different from the equation of state of this really colder separated neutron stars. So waves coming from the post-merger object can probe hot, dense nucleus uh, equational state as opposed to cold ones. Now, 
the lambda you saw on the previous slide, the small lambda, it actually has an effect on the phasing. Okay, this is the phasing of the gravitational waves, which is what we directly measure. And um, I'm showing this because uh, this again was a painstaking calculation. Of course, the leading order term here is Newtonian, so that itself was not that difficult, but we have gone beyond the Newtonian and have included higher order correction term. And um, people like Arun have also contributed to this. What we directly measure is a combination of the, the tidal deformability, as it is called, of the first neutron star and the second one. So this is the you know, more complex quantity that we actually directly measure with the phase. And so this makes life difficult because you have to isolate the effect of the equational state in these big lambdas from the two masses involved. But luckily, we can measure the masses with some accuracy devoid of the tidal effects if we track the early part of the waveforms where you know the tides are still very low right problem is that um, even with this you know somewhat close by events um, we could not do that measurement very accurately so there is some degeneracy between the masses and um, the equational state parameters but with multiple observations we can gradually re reduce that degeneracy because if you observe gravitational waves from a different neutron star system then the masses there could be different now imagine building this up over hundreds of them, and then the one common thing you expect will remain across these hundred observations will be the equation of state parameter because that is what we believe is true in nature. Right? So that is so these ideas have been proposed as well. So this plot you saw before, this is the uh, tidal polarizability parameter, that combination of small lambda over m to the five for the uh, secondary neutron star, somewhat lighter, which had a mass of something like 10% more than the mass of Sun. And this is lambda 1. This is for the primary. And so you notice that yeah, we didn't go all the way to 100,000 because we start constraining. This is the 90% contour. Okay? So, with 90, so for 90% of our observations of you know, this kind of a system in LIGO noise, we will be able to tell that the lambda 2 and lambda 1 values were within this region. Okay? And um, this all, uh, to compare things with the equations of state you saw before, this is that Mueller zero MS1 equation of state. And this is um, a somewhat um, a softer equation of state. H4 is relatively stiffer. Okay, APR4, ASLY, again, these are um, technical names, but these are very equa um, stiff equations, sorry, very soft equations of state. Soft means that the object is more compact, less pressure. Right? So these are still in the running. Um, so it will be more challenging to, in fact, um, to disprove them. And, and one of the main did be the true one. Um, so the previous slide was when uh, the spin uncertainty, you know, we can't measure the spins of the neutron stars very well. Um, the spin uncertainty in the previous slide was assumed to be uh, very large. In this case, it was taken to be small, meaning as small as less than 5% the maximum spin allowed for these masses. And then um, these, um, Plots, the, these contours, 90% are, you know, one, one, one sigma contours are even closer. Actually, this is a 50% contour. So we can constrain the values even, even more because this, the spin terms also make the lambda uh, measurements more um, uh, difficult. Um, coming back to, you know, the elementary particle picture, what is going on is um, uncertainty principle, you know, which um, is um, at the heart of quantum mechanics tells us that you cannot pack uh, you know, two neutrons in the same state, which means that as you build up a neutron star, the, you know, adding more neutrons will cost energy. So the overall energy of the star will increase. Um, but this, therefore, gives us a distribution of uh, you know, the number of neutrons as a function of energy. And eventually, the nucleonic interactions have a handle on how much pressure such a soup exert. Right? and therefore make it more and more difficult to add more neutrons. Uh, because eventually then it will collapse, uh, because gravity will overtake the degeneracy pressure this, these neutrons can exert because of the uncertainty principle. Um, so in nuclear physics, we can expand the binding energy of these nucleons. Right? Um, here A is the atomic weight of a nucleus as a function of the density of the nucleus and another parameter beta which tells us how much, how many more neutrons you have in this nucleus compared to protons. So beta is defined as the difference between the neutron number and the uh, proton number divided by the atomic weight. Um, 
So you can expand this about a value for beta where the nucleus is symmetric. There are equal number of protons and neutrons. We, in fact, understand the nucleonic interactions under this symmetry very well. But if you want to go beyond that symmetry, and for neutron stars, you cannot escape that. I mean, these are ultimately neutral objects. They're abundantly made uh, more from neutrons than protons. Uh, so you have to entertain at least this second order correction in this asymmetry beta. And this coefficient, which is dependent on the density, is known as the symmetry energy. And this is a fundamental quantity in nuclear physics. The, pro the problem is that the, even this quantity, we actually don't have a very good constraint on from uh, terrestrial experiments. And even if you fold in X-ray observations of um, neutron stars. So if you plot this energy as a function of density, we know how it behaves at very low densities and also at what is known as the nuclear saturation density, um, which is the density of a typical nucleus on Earth. Um, but if you go beyond at higher densities, like 1.5 or two times the nuclear saturation density, rho zero, then we actually don't know how uh, nucleons interact. So people assume certain models, and uh, depending on what the assumptions are, they get a soft equation of state, okay, which means low pressure, or a stiff equation of state, or something in the middle. So this is what we aim to ultimately bind you know, in the future with more observations. Eventually, perhaps we would like to combine gravitational wave observations with X-ray observations. Now, this happening for a single binary neutron star system may or may not happen. So, but nevertheless, it can be possible to do that combination even for heterogeneous systems. Um, Again, um, um, uh, at a somewhat superficial level, um, what I'm showing is a result of a very hard study with some nuclear physics collaborators, where we took a bunch of um, uh, you know, nuclear interaction parameters, including the symmetry energy I talked about before, and then L, which is called the you know, which is the slope of the symmetry energy with respect to that uh, asymmetry parameter beta I showed you on the previous slide, and then there are uh, equational state parameters a and alpha that tell us how the neutron star crust behaves, and then B and beta that tell us how the core behaves, um, and, then, and then a few other things. Problem is, what we can measure are the macroscopic parameters, which is like the second love number, or lambda, which I've seen before, or the radius of a neutron star and its mass. Right? So this is a, um, um, in a large matrix problem. These are the only three macroscopic variables you can measure, but the, the neutron star ultimately is influenced by all of these, you know, of the order of what, uh, more than a dozen parameters. Now, luckily or unluckily, it turns out that some of these parameters have a bigger effect on these observables, gravitational wave observables. Okay, and that is shown by these, you know, uh, the bigger, uh, the black uh, bars. So some bars are pointed, um, you know, downwards, that is because there's a negative correlation, but even that is useful, and others have a positive correlation. But specifically, there are these four parameters that we can use ultimately to model nuclear interactions based on um, astronomical observations. So this is a quest uh, that is underway at the moment, and maybe later this year we can tell you a little more about what would ultimately be determined by these measurements. Maybe not from a single system, but 100 such um, binary neutron stars. And I think Arun just guaranteed us. We'll see those many, right? So. Um, Actually, let me fast forward. Yeah, so combining multiple observations. Now, thankfully, a couple of groups have done this kind of study where they said, yes, you know, let, give me 100 or 200 binary neutron star gravitational wave observations. How well we can determine, not the nuclear parameters I showed, which is something we want to do next, but they determined uh, essentially the tidal deformity parameter lambda, the small lambda. And they find that, okay, they started with, you know, three different equations of state, and in this case, basically, the red, I, uh, I'm yeah, pretty sure is, this, is a soft equation of state, like uh, APR4, and the blue is a stiff equation of state, maybe very close to, yeah, H4, okay, so let me see. No, MS1, which, in fact, we are almost ruling out now, MS1. H4 is green, and the strange quark matter is really soft. I mean, this is not completely ruled out by SQM3. SQM1 is, um, so that is the red. And they find that, if you make um, of the order of um, you know, tens of observations, 50, 60, 70, then um, you can distinguish some of the softer equations of state, the red and the green, from the stiffer equation of state, blue, but not, you can't make a distinction between those two soft equations of state, unless you combine um, gravitational wave observations from 
over 100 or so um, uh, binaries. Um, but even then, I mean, no, this was a very pessimistic um, analysis maybe a couple of years ago uh, when it was published. But they got it published, uh, so that's a great thing. But now it has relevance, not, given that we have started observing these objects. Um, and I will, I'm going to end, do I have about five minutes, with, with post-merger waveforms. Um, so once the two neutron stars have merged, uh, what do they look like, the gravitational wave signals? You know, they are not damned sinusoids, so they're unlike black hole mergers. Rather, these oscillations in time are, uh, you know, are going to remain for tens to maybe even 100 milliseconds. So uh, here again, I'm going from stiff equations of state to soft equations of state. And then this is the spectrum. By the way, there is a faint curve in all of them. And the faint curve is something that we modeled in this paper. So we have some analytical understanding, and that is reassuring, for why we have these oscillations. For example, this peak oscillation is nothing but the fundamental bar mode, you know, once the two neutron stars um, are, have already you know, made contact and are in the process of uh, merging. And then in the same paper, we showed that if you have about 100 such observations, then you can determine the radius, the average radius of a neutron star um, um, reasonably well, to about 10% or less. It's easier to um, constrain the radius, which is what is shown here. Um, and this is basically stiffness uh, parameter increasing from um, uh, you know, some value here, so soft value, to a very stiff value out there. So stiffer equations of state, the radius is easier to determine simply because they're extended and um, they have a larger impact on the waveform compared to the softer ones. But even for soft ones, what we see is that, yeah, of the order of 20% constraint with, um, in this case, um, uh, 20 observations is not impossible. With 100 observations, it can come down to a little over 10%. And these things can, be, can have useful implications um, uh, in nuclear physics. So the takeaway messages are that, yes, GW170817 has opened the floodgates for a variety of astrophysical explorations, and I touched only one of them. My colleagues in past talks um, um, alluded to um, some others. So, yeah, so this includes a better understanding of nuclear interactions at high densities. Equation of state parameter measurement accuracy will improve with more observations of double neutron star systems, and there is scope for more work on resolving complication systematics. Um, you know, very much like what actually happened pretty successfully with high redshift supernovae, which eventually showed that you know, dark energy is for real. Um, and of course, there is also scope for um, uh, work in combining gravitational wave observations with um, uh, electromagnetic observations, specifically uh, from extra binaries. With that, thank you. Thank you, Sukhan. Okay, questions? Yes. Uh, Shukanto, going to your plot where you show uh, the which equations of state are most satisfied by this observation, mm -hmm. the nuclear compressibility parameter, I think, can be also determined for unsaturated matter by experimental observations, right? So you already have, so can you tell for saturated nuclear matter, how well is this observation sort of matching up with the results from the unsaturated one? Um, I actually, as far as I know, the, you know, terrestrial observations did not quite rule out MS-1. Okay. Yeah. And that is why you will find even very recent studies that use that equation of state. Yeah. So, so in that sense, I would say this is success. This is a success that we have at least used some of the very stiff equations of state. Thanks. Can I ask, a, a, pardon me for this very vague question, uh, would I be right in saying that in order to pursue study of gravitational waves from the coalesced object before it becomes a black hole, if at all it does, one has to wait for the next generation instruments, right? Because I was just asking Bala this question after the first talk, the, the present observations cut off at I don't know how many hertz. And you're talking about things beyond that, isn't it? So, yeah, it's, not, so it's not within the range of advanced LIGO. I kept this slide for you. Um, so this is, um, you know, projector sensitivity uh, improvement. Um, at the moment, we are three times less sensitive in the strain on the vertical axis compared to the advanced LIGO design. Um, you know, Einstein telescope is um, a unicorn. We don't know whether it can really exist. Somebody just drew this curve ten times, you know, better at almost all uh, frequencies. Um, 
So this is uh, um, uh, a binary neutron star waveform with uh, these you know, peaks. That is the fundamental mode I showed in my earlier slides and other sideband, uh, well, not quite sidebands, but some mode mixing is present because of the fact that you have these two neutron stars. Uh, you know, just radial oscillations by themselves will not give you gravitational waves, but then this is also spinning, and um, so they can create uh, other frequencies in gravitational wave emission. So, um, if we are lucky, then uh, you know this shows that uh, I actually don't recall this paper used what distance for this object, but I'm guessing about 100 megaparsec, and they're arguing that yeah, we have to be really lucky to be able to pick up the most prominent post-merger oscillation. Now. This, at this event at 40 megaparsec, I would say with it, we actually had a you know, chance of observing this, provided we had advanced LIGO sensitivity currently, but we didn't. So we are at least a factor of you know, three to four shy. Um, in advanced LIGO, it has been projected partly in, the, in, in one of my works and also by a few others, that um, a merger at 40 megaparsec could have a signal to noise ratio of a little less than five. So one can start constraining some of the equations of state. Uh, again, stiffer ones are easier than. Does that answer your question? Uh, Sukant, you had shown the table on uh, love number, mass, and radius relationships. Yeah. How, sensitive, how sensitive would these be to spin? For example, if you are to imagine these, uh, the neutron stars to be coalescing, at some point, quite close, the rotation will be close to Keplerian. Yeah, so, so spin will have an effect. That's a good question. For this study, we uh, neglected spin. Or actually, there's a, there's a related study where we, we constrained the spin to be less than 5% of maximal. Um, but there is um, degeneracy with the spin parameter. And um, what it essentially means is that you will need more observations. So instead of 100, maybe 150 observations. Um, but then astrophysically, we don't really have a strong prior for neutron stars and double neutron star systems having spin, you know, as this close to coalescence of much greater than 5%. So I hope nature complies just like... If there is tidal locking, if there is tidal locking, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, one would expect this to spin up quite a bit. Then, I mean, the merged merged uh, star would be less, would have less, uh, less angular velocity. Because the angular velocity would be carried away by the gravitational waves. Yeah. Angular momentum, sorry, angular okay. momentum. So to clarify, for, for this study, I was actually confining myself to just the orbital phase. So we did not extend this one for, to the post-merger phase. But it's true that, yes, um, so there will be some loss of angular momentum. Um, uh, by this merging object and as they actually eventually call us. Um, so, but then that's a, that's a different ball game because the signal there depends on these parameters differently in the post-merger oscillations. Um, in a way, that's a good thing because if the thermal effects are not uh, going to interfere too much, I, I don't know, this is still work in progress, then the post-merger observations can complement the pre-merger observations to perhaps give better constraints on the you know, nuclear parameters. Somewhat like what we have done, you know, you've seen these plots perhaps with the dark energy and you know, matter content in the universe with you know, BAO and uh, high redshift supernovae, uh, air ellipses on one hand and uh, the CMB on the other hand. Um, so again, there, are, there is scope for improving upon these studies to see how we can uh, get to narrower and narrower air ellipses. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Maybe more naive question. Uh, uh, from the uh, the electromagnetic signals that you got, uh, that one got the gamma ray burst, the time delay between them, don't those give you some constraints on the... Thank you for asking that question. I, I should have actually <laughs> mentioned it in my talk. I don't think I have a slide here. Yes, people have numerically evolved these systems um, and with different equations of state, and therefore they have found there is different uh, amount of ejecta. Maybe there is a slide, but I will not take up uh, Bala's time. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a there is an animation, but anyway, there is a different amount of ejected material. Some of it even you know gets unbound, and so these decompressed neutrons then go through uh, you know radioactive decay and fission, R process nucleosynthesis. But the luminosity 
of that emission is uh, correlated with the equational state, meaning, again, stiffer equational state would go for a more luminous, say, kilonova, as opposed to a softer equational state. There are some implications on light curves and decay times as well, but many of these studies are very, very fresh. Um, but yes, we have to dig deeper to understand the exact correlations. That's, see, okay, uh, that's, we can keep, we can have lunch here. <laughs> no, thank you, I mean, this really gets me excited because you're absolutely right. But how do we know there was no pre-merger emission? Maybe there was, we were not looking, right? So this actually makes the case for you giving us better clusters, more, you know, compute intensive, <laughs> so that we can search for these triggers early enough, maybe even, you know, um, 10 seconds or 20 seconds before the merger happens. Of course, we have to be favor... No, so, 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 okay, uh, there are two things here. First of all, there could be pre-merger emission. And pre-merger emission um, can happen, for example, because of um, uh, crustal shattering, right? Prediction. There is some evidence for that in X-ray data, for example, but we don't, don't know conclusively what it uh, causes. Um, but, okay, I think there is, uh, there is another one which is um, which for kilonova. Uh, so there, there were, of course, opt, you know, optical, UV, uh, and also um, infrared. In fact, in all bands, I mean, the only band I didn't see in writing was microwave. So, um, so indeed, so some of them were kilonova emissions, right? Specifically from our process nucleosynthesis. But uh, which one are you talking about? Sorry. Yeah. That will result in gamma ray emission. Well, so we have strong frozen and magnetic field, and if you vibrate the yeah, yeah. So, so okay, that that I address addressed in the first part of my answer to this question, right? But but maybe there was, um, you know, they were perhaps not picked up by the X-ray observatories, but you know, some of the so Fermi did it independently, which we agree. But but other observatories, including Chandra, actually followed up, and so those follow up, you know, happened somewhat later. Exactly. So, which is why we need help to find pre-merger emission. Yeah.